Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. We got a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to talk about this morning, so I'm just going to dive right in. Our topic for this morning is: What if my child says they have anxiety or depression? I don't know if you are aware of this or not, but the generation right behind me—I'm 43 years old—the generation right behind me, the millennials, are one of the most depressed and anxious generations that America has ever experienced. Uh, generation Z, who is just behind them. Uh, they would be somewhere around 25 and younger. They are actually even more depressed and anxious than the millennials are. To give you an idea about how depressed and anxious millennials are, 50% uh, of them say they have actually left a workplace job because of a mental health issue. 50%. Um, for Gen Z, granted that entire generation is not out in the world yet, but 18 to 25, 75% uh, of them say they have left a job because of mental health issues. I want you to think about that. 75% leaving a job because of mental health issue. Uh, just so you know, the average in the country is about 20%. So that gives you an idea of where that generation sits. We really are in a place where we have an epidemic of depression in our country. Uh, the lifetime risk of developing major depression is about 17%. And nearly 17 million American adults and 2 million teens will report depression in any given year here in the United States. Depression is now the leading cause of workplace disability, and disease cost is believed to be about $55 billion, with a B, dollars in productivity and workplace absenteeism every single year. Antidepressants are the single most common medication for young adults. And that has increased 400% since 1988. So there's a really interesting question we have to ask ourselves. The World Health Organization and Harvard Medical School have asked the question, is the United States literally the world's saddest nation? 9.6% of Americans will experience major depressive disorder or chronic minor depression over any given year. That is the highest among every single nation they polled. I want you to think about that for a second. Nations who received a better score than us were nations like Lebanon, Mexico, and Nigeria. Countries that are suffering from war, major unemployment, and major poverty. Now to depress something simply means to make it lower than it is. Now what is important about that is honestly every one of us have experienced what you might call depression, but really what that is is the blues, right? There's a total difference between diagnosable depressive disorders and just having the blues. And each and every one of us have ever have experienced that. But let me ask you a question. Are you happy? Are you content? 
What I think is interesting about those questions is this. I describe happiness, I get asked about this sometimes. Happiness, I think, is an external thing. It's out here. So if things out here are going really well, we have a tendency to be, quote, happy. And if things out here are going really bad, we have a tendency not to be happy. But contentment is something totally different. Contentment is what happens in here. Contentment says it doesn't matter what you experience out in the world out there and what's going on in your life. You can be totally okay if you are content. And I will tell you that I think that is part of the major problem we are experiencing. We are not content as a people. We show this in many ways, and some of these will make us uncomfortable, but as you know, most people spend quite a bit more money than they make and are up to their eyeballs in debt. Did you know the average family moves to a bigger house every five years? People change jobs about as often to get a few more dollars, and no one stays where they are very long because they're just not content. They're not okay with where they are. Millennials and Gen Z in particular are the single most depressed, suicidal generation in the history of America. From 2000 to 2015, the suicide rate jumped 27% among young adults. Among the entire population, it rose 21%. So we got problems. We got major problems. And here's what's really interesting. If you want to see the difference in this, depression in college and young people seeking out therapy in college has gone through the roof. And I'll give you kind of some examples. 25 years ago, if a, somebody in college went to a therapist like me to get help, they usually went because they had lost a loved one, because they had maybe experienced some sort of major traumatic event in their life. Maybe their parents were going through a divorce. Maybe there was some kind of really large thing happening in their life, things that no one would look at and go, wow, that's crazy. Why would you go get therapy for that? We all understand why people would go get therapy for that, because when you're experiencing something major like that, it's an important thing to do. But do you know why college students today are going to therapy? Because they're making a B in a class, and they can't figure out how to deal with that. Because they broke up with a boyfriend or girlfriend, and not someone they've dated for three or four years, but someone they've dated for three or four months. Maybe they didn't make the sports team. Maybe they didn't get into the social club that they wanted. And those are the kinds of reasons we are seeing people go to therapy in college today versus over some sort of major event. And here's what's important about that. Researchers have looked everywhere to try to understand why. Why is that? Because on the surface, it doesn't make sense. It makes no logical sense. The two generations behind me are the most formally educated generations ever. From a material perspective, life's never been easier. I mean, we enjoy an overall higher standard of living, longer life expectancy, and more leisure time than any generation in American history. The poorest among us are some of the richest in the world, and our grandparents and great-grandparents even, um, couldn't even imagine the luxuries that we have in life. We, even among the poorest, have a higher standard of living than Europe, most other societies around the world, yet we are miserable. And it makes me think about what Paul says in Philippians. In Philippians chapter 4, verses starting around verse 10, Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. I want you to listen really closely to this part. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I have a little story to go along with that that... Um, I'm not one of those people that has those epiphany moments that people have. Sometimes people talk about these big moments that change their life. I don't really have many of those. But before my oldest son was born, my wife and I, Jessica, we went to Europe on a backpacking trip with our sisters. And one of the places we spent quite a bit of time was in Italy. And we went to Rome. 
And while we were there in Rome, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Rome, but if you, if you ever get to go, there's, if you're looking at it in the Colosseums on your left, you have the Colosseum, and then you have the ancient Roman Forum, which would have been the city of ancient Rome. Of course, now it's just ruins. Pretty cool, but it's just ruins. And at the end of that, there's a place called the Mamertine Prison. And unfortunately, they have, like they have a tendency to do, they've changed it up a lot in recent years. But when we went back before my son was born, it was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. Uh, I remember specifically going down, walking down the stairs, going down in there, and there was a hole in the floor, the middle of the floor. And later found out what that hole was for is they would beat the prisoner, and they would throw the prisoner through that hole into the cell below. And then in the cell below, which was this small circular room, it was damp, it was dark, it was cold, it was black stone, there was a pillar. And they would attach the prisoner to the pillar with a chain. And the floor likely would have been full of feces and sewage. Okay? And it was in that room where it is believed that Paul was incarcerated when he was in Rome shortly before his death. And we went down there and did the whole touristy thing like you do. You go in, you take your pictures, and there's you know, a lot of people down there talking and carrying on. And we started to walk away. And we'd actually started walking down to our next destination. And I turned to my wife and said, I want to go back. And I went back, and it was the weirdest thing. I walked into the prison, and there was not a single person in the room. We had just gone in. There were lots of people in there, you know, taking pictures, talking, carrying on. Not a single person. I was the only person there. And I just stood there for a minute. And I'll tell you the thoughts that went through my mind. That verse went through my mind. And I'm standing there thinking, this is where Paul had thoughts like, I have learned to be content going through his mind. Sitting in a dark, damp, cold room with sewage on the floor, chained to a pillar, beaten, thrown through the hole in the roof. And he is talking about contentment. And I'm going... Here I am complaining about the fact that my kids have lost the remote and I can't find it, right? And Paul is in this situation. And it hit me, standing there, that this idea that that's part of the problem, right? We aren't content. We worry about the most stupid things. And we don't put into perspective what contentment is. Paul says, I have learned, learned to be content. And I think that is hugely important. It is a trait we can learn. And if it is a trait we can learn, it means that no matter what situation we are in, we can be okay. And that's part of the issue. And I want to jump in, and, and, and I'm going to give you some reasons this morning, some reasons that we are so depressed and unhappy and anxious as a society. Okay, and I, the first four points are not mine. They're actually from a guy named Simon Sinek, but they were so fantastic. I was like, I can't not use these points. So I want to I wanna elaborate on some of these points. So here's some of the reasons that we are so depressed and unhappy. First and foremost, we've awarded mediocrity, and we've been doing this for a really long time. And you probably know where I'm going with this idea, but we have raised a couple of generations that have been awarded for things that aren't really achievements. Everybody gets a trophy, as I'm sure you have heard. When you are told you are special, when you, can, you are told you can have anything you want, when you are rewarded undeservingly, what does that do to you? Well, you don't aspire to really achieve anything. You don't appreciate what you have, and what you have comes with little or no effort. So you begin to believe in the idea of maximum reward for minimum effort. We have a word for that, by the way. It's called entitled. Believing that you should be giving things just because you are special, just because you are awesome, and just because you deserve it. And the thing is, in the real world, at least in years prior to this, I'm starting to wonder if we're going this direction now, but used to, you would understand, it wouldn't take very long for you to see that you don't get rewarded for nothing in the world. Uh, we're starting to see that change, unfortunately. But millennial and Gen Z, as I've said, report lower self-esteem than any other generation. And you know what's really interesting? We now know, because there's been so much research done on it, that being rewarded for not doing well actually makes a person feel worse. The whole reason that that whole movement started was when I was a kid, our parents were starting to be taught the idea of self-esteem and the importance of self-esteem. 
And as a therapist, let me tell you, self-esteem is actually very, very important. But it got messed up because what happened is they started to believe, well, to make my kid feel good, they need to be given the trophy too, even if they don't win the baseball tournament. Well, we now know that that makes children feel worse because what happened is really, really, really easy. They know they didn't deserve it. Deep down inside, they know they didn't deserve the trophy, but they got it anyways. And not only that, the person who works really hard, guess what happens to them? What upsets them? Because they go, well, I worked hard. I did all these things, and I didn't get anything more than anybody who didn't do anything. So the whole idea of this actually impacts both sides in a negative perspective. Isn't that amazing? You know where self-esteem is actually built? Self-esteem is built by knowing you have accomplished something. It comes from knowing you've worked hard. It comes from knowing you've put in effort, that you've done what is necessary for you to achieve your goal. And if you don't put that effort in and you get rewarded anyways, well, it doesn't build proper self-esteem. And if you do put in the effort and you do work hard, but then you don't get anything else out of it more than anyone else did, you realize your work is futile. So we've rewarded mediocrity, and that's one of the reasons we are where we are. The second one probably comes as no surprise to anybody in this room, and that is technology. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, doesn't matter, whatever you put in there, the reality is we put filters on and we show the world as that fabulous. Everything in our world is fabulous. You know, I always joke, you know, everybody puts that perfect family picture on Facebook. And we all know deep down inside that they took 45 shots to get that picture and the kids were crying and screaming and mad at each other and throwing things and, and they caught like that half second moment where everybody had the right smile on their face and that's what we see. But the problem is, is we compare that. We compare ourselves to other people. Not only is that dangerous, but here's another thing. Social media is addictive and it is numbing. And if you've ever watched documentaries on the people who created a lot of these things, they won't even let their kids use them because they understand that they were made to be addictive. Uh, you get a dopamine hit when you see that little red button or that little red notification at the bottom of Facebook. Let me ask you something. If you open up Facebook and you see that there, how long will it take you before you actually click on it to see what all those people said? If your phone dings for a text, how long can you wait without checking that text? Can you go put your phone down for hours and not look at it? Those things create addictive properties. We don't have time to go all into that. I wish we did, but it is addictive. And one of the problems that we are seeing, and to me this is the most important part about social media and technology, we have a generation growing up that doesn't seem to know how to form deep, meaningful relationships. And that's scary, okay? As far as we know, that's never been an issue before, where, they, where people had tr trouble building deep, meaningful relationships. And part of that is because so much communication happens through devices. That, to me, is one of the most terrible things about what has happened with COVID, if we've accepted Zoom and communications through devices. That's terrible. It is easy to criticize someone through a device, but it's much more difficult to criticize a person to their face. If you don't believe that, just scroll down a Facebook comment section. Right? Research shows that many people uh, from these two generations view their friends as people they know they can hang out with. But here's the kicker. They don't feel like they can actually count on their friends. You see the difference in that? I can hang out with them, but if I really needed them, they wouldn't be there. It's pretty incredible to be able to have a thousand Facebook friends but not have a single person you feel as if you can rely on if you needed them. Not only that, it's coping mechanism problem. They don't have coping mechanisms. A part of this is they don't know they, when they are down, when they are out, what do they do? They don't turn to a person. You know, when I, was a, when I was a teenager, and I'm not that ancient, when I was a teenager, if you had problems, you wouldn't talk to somebody. Talk to a friend about what you were going through. They don't do that now. What do they do? They go to a device to deal with that. And studies clearly show, it's not even debatable, a direct correlation between depression 
and the number of hours that you spend on social media. A direct correlation. Number three is impatience. We live in a society of instant gratification. If you want something, you can go on your phone right now as we are talking and you can have it definitely by tomorrow morning on your doorstep. Without ever leaving your house if you don't want to. If you want to binge watch a TV show, you can go to Netflix and you can watch the whole thing. You don't have to wait till next week for the next episode to come out. The idea of going and checking movie times to figure out what time you need to go to a movie is a long lost concept, right? Most of the time you can pull it up on Disney Plus or a streaming service or on your device. You don't have to wait on anything. So here's the other part of that, just talking about relationships. If you want to go on a date, you don't even have to learn the awkwardness of trying to go meander and be, feel stupid and go talk to somebody. You can just open up an app and swipe right. Right? You can. You know that's true. So we have gone down this road where things are so instant. And here's the thing that I want to tell you. Things that really matter in life, like job satisfaction, like the strength of a relationship, like learning a lifelong skill, those things are hard and messy and difficult. And there isn't an app for those things. Not an app for those things. They take time. You can't do them overnight. And that's why we have young people who get out of school and they think they should have a $100,000 job the second they walk out of college. It's not realistic. Because those things take time. And when you have a generation that has no idea what patience is, they don't understand why those things can happen. Fourth one is environment. We have, we have built an environment that is so dependent on technology that people can't connect. And let me give you an idea. If you go to a concert, to a baseball game, if you're sitting in a doctor or a dentist office, do you pull out your phone and look at your phone? Or do you talk to the stranger sitting next to you? Which do you do? Most of us pull out our phone, right? So we are losing those little moments. Now you may think, well, what's the point? That's a stranger. I'll never see that person again. I, I'm not really going to create a connection with them. What does it matter? Well, let me tell you what it matters. Especially if you are a younger person, what do you learn in that moment? You're learning very vital social skills. You're learning how to talk to someone, how to connect with someone, how to shake a hand, how to just have that chit chat that you used to have with strangers. But when you look down at a device, you miss those little moments of living and connecting and actually being a real part of the world that we are living in. And number five, we have become an emotionally based society. Here's what I mean by that. Every time I have a new client, one of the things that I will do is I will sit down in my office and I will talk to them about healthy and impaired emotions. And I think that is vitally important because we as human beings are absolutely terrible with emotions. And one thing that is important here is most people don't even know the difference between what a healthy emotional reaction is and an unhealthy emotional reaction. Most people don't know how to control their emotions. They let their emotions control them. We tend to overreact. We tend to not keep things in perspective. And, you know, I'm not trying to be political here, but if you don't believe that people are emotional, just take a look at the political environment we currently live in. Do you think people are in control of their emotions or do you think emotions are controlling them? Right? It's almost as if we are completely devoid as a nation of common sense, of logic, and nuance. Those things have gone completely out the window in favor for insane emotional reactions. And that's a problem. And the final one I think is extremely important, and God is systematically being removed from our society. Let's be very real here. We are becoming a godless society. And when we don't have God in our lives, where is it do we, do we turn? I'll tell you where most people turn. They turn to themselves. They turn to themselves. They become their own gods. And you may think, well, that sounds really stupid. But let me ask you this. If your views about issues and morality are the single most important thing, and that is how you live your life because you know what is best for you, you have become your own god. Because that's all that matters. Your view is what's important. Your view is what's, um, what, what's there. And what do we start to do? Well, we turn to government for answers. We turn to the experts for the answers. We turn to any and everything but the creator who made us for the answers. And when society is devoid of God, there is no standard, 
And I think that's clearly where we are. So what do we do about this? I know when I teach lessons like this, it sounds really doom and gloom, and it sounds like things are really bad, but I'll tell you, I think the answers are pretty simple. We as parents have to take our children back from the world. It's that simple. We have got to teach our children how to handle the insanity around them. And you may say, well, based on what I see out there in this world, that seems like an impossible thing. I don't think it is at all. I think it's a change that can happen in a single generation. But I think it takes parents instilling the right things in their kids. We have to realize the influence and impact on the children that we have is profound. And it happens at a very young age. I'll tell you one of the biggest mistakes parents make. Parents think that they are going to start to instill those things in their children when they are 12, 13 years old. If you are going to start instilling things in your children when you were a teenager, you've already lost. And I hate to say that in that way because that, a lot of parents are in that boat. But the reality is you have to start when they are very young. Instilling the proper things in them when they are young and you can change this world. Now, we have to start teaching them how to see this world when they are little. And most research says that kids form the way they see the world by the time they are about 12. Let me repeat that. Most studies say that children form the way they see this world by the time they are about 12. Now that is hugely important because what that means is we've got this small window of time where we can shape them in a certain way. And that is extremely important. And you know what's powerful about that? You may say, well, I don't know what to teach my kids. People will freak out and panic. They don't know what to do. Let me tell you something. You have to be the example. It's that simple. You being the proper example to them is where they learn those things. And I think it begins with one very simple word, okay? And that is this, teach your kids to be resilient. I get asked this all the time, What's, what can I do to help my kids? And I, I, that's my answer, it's one word, teach them to be resilient. That's it. And that is one of the biggest problems in this world. Here's the thing we forget sometimes, our, our experience as adults is filled with serious responsibilities. But childhood isn't exactly stress-free and easy. It's really not. Kids take tests. They learn new information. They change schools. They change neighborhoods. They get sick. They get braces. They encounter bullies. They make new friends. They have friends who betray them. They have all kinds of little things that happen in their lives. And it may seem really simple, but it's hugely important. And what helps kids navigate these things is what is called resilience. Resilient kids are problem solvers. And what they do is they face a tough situation and they figure out how to handle it. It isn't a birthright, as Paul said, when about being content, he learned how to do that. He learned how to do that. That is what's important. We have to equip our skills, our kids with the skills to handle the unexpected, which is totally different than our world. Okay? I want you to notice it's totally different than our world. We have become a culture in where we try to make our kids comfortable. We are trying to stay one step ahead of them so they don't face any challenges that make them uncomfortable. Let me tell you something. That's the worst possible thing we can do as a society. Anxious people in particular have a hard time letting their kids tolerate uncertainty simply because they can't handle uncertainty themselves. A parent's job isn't to be there for their kids all the time. That's not your job. It's to teach them how to handle the things they have come at them in life. So I'm going to give you some quick ones. I know we're going to run out on time because I'm long-winded, but we'll make this as quick as we can, all right? And don't accommodate their every need. So I'm going to go fast because I've got 10 points. I think, think 10. We're going to do this quick. Don't accommodate their every need. Whenever we try to provide certainty and comfort for our children, we are getting in the way of them learning to problem solve. Overprotecting kids creates anxiety. What did I just say about this generation? The millennials and Gen Z, what is their problem? They are so anxious they can't even work, okay? 50% of millennials, 75% of Gen Z have trouble working because it's so stressful for them. So that's because we've accommodated their every need, okay? We have to not do that. If your child gets out of school at 315, I know parents, I know parents who come an hour early so their kids don't have to wait. Make your kids wait. Make them wait 30 minutes or 15 minutes. Make them wait. 
It's okay for them to have to go through that. You know, I know kids who have, people who have seven and eight-year-olds, and they let them sleep in the room or in the bed with them. Oh, my goodness, kick them out of the bed and put them in the room. Let me tell you something. There have been billions of people that have learned how to sleep by themselves. Your child's not the exception. They can figure it out. We need to learn to do that, folks. Number two, we have got to avoid eliminating all risk. I understand wanting to keep parents or kids safe. I'm a parent. I've got two. I want to keep mine safe, too. But we can't eliminate risks. I know this is going to make, it might make some of you angry, but look, the way we have handled COVID has blown my mind. You know, we, we, we have talked about, I'll tell you, I'll say this right here, I need to put the disclaimer out there. I'm not a, mem I'm not a doctor. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. But you know what I am? I am a mental health professional. And you know what I know is making our kids go through what they have gone through is going to destroy a generation. Let me tell you, I believe that with all my heart. We are screwing up a grown generation of kids, and this is the thing. If you are under 70 and in decent health, you are more likely to die in a car wreck than you are from COVID. But we have made our kids think this is Ebola where half of them are going to be wiped out and die. It's unbelievable. We are killing our kids. Risk is something our kids need to learn, that everything you do Stepping out of the bathtub is risky. Walking down the stairs is risky. Getting in your car and driving is risky. That's okay. Life is full of risks. Life is full of them, and we need to teach our kids that it is okay for things to be risky. Okay? Sorry, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. All right? Teach them to problem solve. Teach them to problem solve. Let me say, let me tell you this, if your kid doesn't want to go to Bible camp because they're scared to spend the night away from your house, teach them how to figure that problem out. How do you deal with that? Maybe they need to go spend the night at their grandparents' house. Maybe they need to go spend the night at a friend's house. Maybe they need to take their favorite teddy bear blanket with them. I don't care. Teach them how to deal with that, okay? It's normal to be homesick. It is. Normal to be homesick. I've been homesick before. I've been homesick as an adult missing my kids. But you know what? I, I, I don't not go on a trip because I'm afraid I'm going to miss my kids. You've got to learn how to deal with that. Teach them how to problem solve, and that's something we need to do. Teach your kids concrete skills. Focus on specific skills. Let me tell you something. This idea of kids having to swipe right to go on a date drives me nuts. Teach them how to talk to a girl or a boy. Teach them how to do that. Teach them how to shake a stranger's hand. Teach them how to come have a conversation with someone that they don't know. Teach them how to prepare a lesson for Bible class if they're old enough to do that, and have them stand up in front of a group of people and teach. Teach them skills. And if you teach them skills, guess what that does? It will help them learn to deal with more and more things. I, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to throw this out there. My mom runs a restaurant, and she doesn't hire people very often. And you know why she doesn't hire people very often? First of all, it's hard to find people that work. But second of all, when she gets people in, most of them don't have basic life skills. Do you know what my mom looks for? I ask her about this. This, what do you look for? She said, I look for really simple things. Can you carry on a conversation with a customer? Can you do that? Can you get the order right and pay attention to details? Can you have a smile on your face and do your job even if you're having a bad day? Those are things my mom looks for. In hiring people to work for her, that's what she looks for. Very simple things, but you know what's wild? Most people under 40 can't do that. Is that not incredible? Those are basic life skills, teachable life skills that anyone can learn. All right? Avoid why questions. I love this one. Why questions do not help promote problem solving. Let me give you an example. Your kid leaves their bike outside in the rain, and they come in and you go, why did you do that? Well, if they answer that question honestly, the answer would probably be, well, I'm eight years old and I'm irresponsible. Right? Why questions don't help? Ask them, you left your bike out in the rain, what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about that? The chain is now rusted. You're going to have to figure out how to fix that. What are you going to do about that? What does that simple change in question promote? It promotes problem solving. And that's what you want to teach your kids. Teach your kids to problem solve. Very, very important. All right? Don't provide all of the answers. You know, I think this is really important. And, and over the years, I will be honest with you, as someone who always felt like I had to know the answers, 
I would, you know, I would always, used to, years ago, I would try to come up with the answer. I've gotten really comfortable with saying, I don't know. Really comfortable with saying, I don't know. Do that with your kids. Because here's the thing, that will help them understand that not everything is certain. Let me give you an example. Your kid goes, am I going to have a shot at the doctor today? I don't know. I don't know if you are or not. I have no idea. You know what? If you have a shot at the doctor today, I'll take you to Sonic after we get done. Right? You can do that. It's okay for your children not to know. One of the things that's really interesting, you'll see this with college students. Maybe their college student about to go off to school is nervous. And parents start to, you'll love it. It'll be the greatest days of your life. What if it's not? What if it's not the best days of their life? What if they hate it? Right? So you can actually say to them, I don't know if you'll like it or not, but you know what? Millions of others have figured out how to deal with that, and you will too. Right? Teach them that. Do not provide all the answers for them. Don't tell them everything. And I even sometimes will say, I don't do this enough, I need to do it more. I don't know, you tell me. They ask you a question, I don't know, you tell me. That's important. What does that cause them to do? That causes them to think through it themselves instead of you just giving the answer. Avoid talking catastrophic terms. I think this is really important, and I could give you all kinds of examples of this, but I mean, come on, COVID's a perfect example of this. We've talked about this in catastrophic terms for 18 months. I'll never forget, as long as I live, when this first started, every single channel, even sports channels, were running a ticker either at the bottom of the screen or the side of the screen of the number of hospitalizations and the number of deaths. Now, I don't care what it is. If you ran that across every, every, it could be in the number of car wrecks, and you ran that across the screen of every channel everywhere, and every time you turned on the radio, the TV, looked on the internet, everywhere you looked, that's there. What is that going to do to a society? You know as well as I do, I don't care what it is, you're going to freak them out. You're going to scare them to death. And we have talked about this in catastrophic terms every day. Let me tell you something, you can teach your kids the realities of something without freaking them out and scaring them to death, which is what so many parents have done. I'll tell you, I've tried to have numerous conversations with my kids about perspective during all this. I've tried to teach them, look, I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not saying it's not scary and you can't get sick, but what I'm telling you, you're going to have to learn how to figure out how to live. You're going to have to figure out how to live through all this, and that's okay. Y you know what's interesting? Studies show that if a kid falls down, and scrapes their knee. Now, I'm not talking about they fall out of a tree and break their leg. I'm talking about they fall down and scrape their knee. Studies show that your reaction teaches them how they're to react to that. So if they fall down and scrape their knee, and you flip out, and you scream and run after them, and treat them as if they have fallen out of a tree and broken their leg, what have you just taught them? That every time that they fall down, it is catastrophic. If they fall down and scrape their knee and you mosey over there to make sure they're okay and help them dust off and go along their way, what have you just taught them? Falling down and scraping your knee is not a big deal. Wipe yourself off, get up, and go play. That's what you've taught them. It is very important that we don't talk and teach our kids catastrophe. Next one, let your kids make mistakes. You know, if a child has an assignment and they have an anxious or overprotective parent, you know what's going to happen, right? That parent is probably going to do the assignment for them or at least do the vast majority of it. Let me tell you something. I actually think that's the worst thing in the world you can do. What you need to do if your kid doesn't want to put in the time and the effort to do an assignment, let them turn it in like that. Let them fail. Let them figure out what happens when they don't do that. They don't want to go to football practice, let them stay home. Because when they're riding the bench, you just taught them a great lesson. It's okay. If your child, you know, is afraid to get a B on a test, doesn't want to work hard enough though not to get the B, let them get the B. Let them fail it. Let them do whatever. We'll teach them those powerful, powerful lessons. I'm, uh, I'll embarrass my son here, but it's okay. Uh, he'll get over it. Um, years, a few years ago, look at the face, look at those faces like, thanks. A few years ago, he left his back, and he's extremely responsible. Let me just tell you. Like, I'm so proud of him. I saw I say this. I'm so proud of him. He's extremely responsible. A few years ago, he left, two, three years ago, left a backpack at the house. 
and I had some assignments in it that he needed at school that day. And my wife called me, and she said, hey, can you drop Will's backpack off at school? He forgot it, and there's some things in there he's going to need for today. And I would have done it. I actually would have done it because he's very responsible, and I understand people forget things. I mean, I'm forgetful, right? So this wasn't really a life lesson I was trying to teach. It was just, I, I can't. I said, I've got sessions today. And I said, I'm driving into work right now. I, can't, I don't have time. And she said, well, well what are we going to do? And I said, well, I said, I guess he'll go without his backpack today. And I said, he probably won't forget it again. As far as I know, he never has. As far as I know, he never has. Why? Because he probably realized this is really important. I grabbed that thing if there's things I needed, right? And that's an important life lesson. It's okay. Number nine, help them manage emotions. Emotional management, I believe, is one of the major keys to resilience. Teach their kids that emotions are okay. A lot of people don't know this. When I teach emotions, I never teach that emotion is inappropriate, per se. If you are angry, guess what? It's all right if you're angry. It's fine. Feel that emotion. It's okay to feel that emotion. The important part is not to let that emotion control you and to figure out what do you do next. How do you deal with it? I say all the time to clients, I will say, I will never tell a client you don't feel that way. Because they do. And it's okay to feel that way. But what do you do with it? What's the next step? Kids learn very quickly that powerful emotions can get them what they want. If you have a smaller child or have had a smaller child, you understand this greatly. They will throw a fits, they will attempt to wear you down, and they will sometimes really will wear you down. I've had that happen. My youngest can be challenging. And he wears us down sometimes. But here's where parents fail, and I admit sometimes I even fail in this. But here is the thing. If you let your child wear you down and you give them what they want, what happens? You have just reinforced that. You have just taught them, you throw a big enough fit, you give me a hard enough time, I'll give you what you want. And there are a lot of parents who do that. Do not give in. They will learn that you mean what you say, and it will make things better in the long run. And this doesn't start when they are teens. This starts when they are tea tiny. You better work on that when they're little. Recognize they are learning from a very young age how to outsmart you. And kids do it all the time. I see parents, I see kids running their households all the time in my line of work. That's unbelievable. But it happens all the time. And I know we're about out of time, and yay, I'm right on time. Model resiliency. Kids learn from observing their parents' behavior. Try to be calm. Try to be consistent. You cannot say to a child that you want them to control their emotions when you are flipping out yourself. Can't do it. When you make a mistake, admit it. Admit that you mess up. Admit that you handle things poorly. It's okay to do that. Resiliency will help kids navigate the inevitable trials and triumphs of life that they are going to challenge. And resilient kids become resilient adults. And resilient adults are able to survive and they are able to thrive among life's unavoidable stressors. I'll wrap up with this. One particular trend that I've noticed over the years is that the parents today are much less likely to teach their kids these principles. They are. And many parents now unwittingly are raising kids who lack resiliency. They lack the capacity to be able to recover from disappointment and difficult situations. And I'll just tell you, this is not probably politically correct to say it this way, but without a little grit, kids are going to fall apart and become completely immobilized in the face of difficult circumstances. They have to learn the ability to swiftly bounce back and to face the tasks and challenges of life. So we could talk about that more and more and more, but I know we got to go. So there you go. How do you teach your kids to be resilient? There it is. And if you teach kids to be resilient, guess what? You don't have to worry about anxiety and depression at all because it's not going to exist in them. Thank you guys for your time. I hope you stick around for our afternoon sessions, which are going to be uh, pretty interesting, I think. So you all have a good day.